Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chen. Uh, Professor Chen is one of my most respected colleagues uh, in the industry, and I'm pleased to see that he's going to uh, spend more time in the greater China area. Uh, a lot of you probably know me through uh, Google or my books or Sinovation Ventures, Chongqing Gongchang, as our uh, incubator for young entrepreneurs. But uh, today, actually, I want to tell you what my real background was, which sometimes I omit. Uh, I actually, this is my application to graduate school. I was an undergraduate at Columbia, and I wanted to attend and get a PhD in computer science. And this is what I wrote. This is the, the actual application I sent to a number of universities. I ended up going to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, this was back in 1983, uh, when I thought really the final frontier will be to understand how our brain works. And if the computer could become our brain, be connected to our brain, we understand how the human thinking works, this is the final frontier that we could conquer. Um, little did I know <laughs> that uh, this field would end up uh, becoming uh, so hot and uh, so hot uh, so quickly, even though it's 30 some years later, and that my original aspiration would become completely different. So later I will tell you what actually happened with me and with AI and why we're all in in artificial intelligence in Sinovation Ventures. When you come and visit us in Chongqing Gongchang, there are no more incubated companies. We do not do angel investments anymore. So I talk about, you know, with many of my friends, well, are you going to talk about how to start a new company? I think there's a much greater thing that all of us have to understand and capture and, and use because it's just like the internet. I think early days, uh, and Andrew, Andy Grove said, uh, any company that doesn't understand the internet is going to be perished because of it. And it has, everyone has to embrace it. And I think AI is something much bigger than even internet. So it's something everyone has to understand. It's a great investment opportunity for us. And it's, a, it's going to impact not just uh, technology companies. It's going to change every traditional company, change education, change society, change the way governments think. So it is something so big that we are no longer doing incubation, Sinovation Ventures, we haven't changed our name, but we are completely into artificial intelligence, and I want to tell you why. And also you will learn that my original uh, aspiration turned out to be a little naive, uh, that AI today is not at all about taking the human brain or connecting to it. And anyone who tells you so is um, perhaps overly optimistic or overly naive. Um, and I will proceed to explain what AI is. So I actually, before I went to um, Apple, I actually did a lot of work uh, involving computer gaming, uh, actually developed the first uh, 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 program. I wrote the code myself that be the world champion. Uh, not Go, but Othello. And I also wrote the first speech recognition system that could understand speaker independent continuous speech. So that was my work before I went and became a technology executive and a venture capitalist. But this is, these are the memories that will always stay with me. And I think the fundamental understanding of these technologies makes us um, uh, better off in terms of uh, investor and the company that we do. So really, this is the history of AI. In the 50s, uh, people said, we're going to figure out how the brain works, and then we're going to solve it in 10 years. And then all the expectations got built up, and then, of course, not, did not deliver. And people said, you liar, and then funding stopped. And again, right after my PhD thesis, people said, wow, AI is going to change the world. It's going to be not through expert systems, but through neural networks. And then, of course, it also failed to deliver. And now we're uh, at even a higher level of expectation than ever. So I think a fair question for people to ask is, is this for real? or are we going to be facing another hype? And, and I think if there's one single most important message is that this time it is for real. And the most important thing that happened is something called deep learning. Now AI is bigger, is big. It includes a discipline called machine learning. And machine learning is big. It includes a discipline called um, deep learning. Now, however, deep learning turned out to be the biggest um, discovery um, that is really reshaping many aspects of our society. And this is not a technical talk, so I won't go into a lot of depths. In fact, I'll try to give a most um, a simple to explain 
uh, explanation of what is deep learning. You've probably heard this a lot of places. I see a lot of entrepreneurs put deep learning into their, <laughs> into their uh, project proposal. A lot of people put deep learning on their resumes. But really, what is deep learning? Um, it is basically like Excel. So all of you know Excel, right? It's the spreadsheet. You put in a bunch of numbers. You click. Magic happens, right? You put in all your quarterly numbers, salary, taxes, expenses, income, revenue, taxes. You click, your quarterly earnings comes out. That's Excel. And that is what deep learning does. So you feed in lots of numbers. You click something, some answer comes out. And that answer can be a perception, a prediction, a classification. So in the case of AlphaGo, you feed it lots of go positions, and you the current position outcomes the best move that you can make. You feed lots of people borrowing money and either defaulting or repaying outcomes a prediction about this individual person, whether that he or she will repay or default. You feed lots of stock prices, it will tell you which one will most, most likely go up tomorrow. And, and you feed it um, lots of um, products into a Taobao user, and out comes the one that this user is most likely to buy if you show the ad in front of the user. So that is like Excel. Lots of numbers go in. You click, one answer comes out. It's not always right, but it's maybe the most likely. And you're maxima you're, it's doing an optimization. It's giving you the predictions so that over a large number of data sets, you minimize the default rate, you maximize your investment return, you maximize your ad click through, and that is all. And you can go to more advanced applications where the output is where there are my autonomous vehicles should turn left to by one degree or two degrees, or turn right, or should I press brake or uh, accelerate? So these are basically the output of this neural network, which can be thought of as an Excel spreadsheet. Now that's the similarity. That's where the similarity ends. Uh, it differs from an Excel in the sense that, as you know, Excel cells are programmed. They have formulas that people go in to program. Like, right? like the monthly revenue is the sum of all the daily revenue. Okay? In this, there's no such, no such humanly programmed formula. The formula is magically derived by a black box called deep learning. So you feed it lots of things so that it will learn uh, what is right and wrong. So in the case of um, uh, uh, loan default, you feed it lots of people who've applied for loans. And then you teach it in each case whether this person is likely to default or not. So immediately you think, OK, it's about credit rating. It's about a human banking expert marking this person as a, uh, a high, um, highly suspect of defaulting or not. No, cannot do that. Because if you have human label going into the deep learning, then you're bound to not exceed human performance. We're here to dramatically outperform humans. So that's why AlphaGo cannot just learn a human play. It's got to play itself. So similarly, what should you teach a loan approval program, a loan underwriting program? You need to teach it by data with actual people who've borrowed money, lots of data about themselves, and the actual facts of whether they defaulted or not. So when you have that data, it becomes grand truth because it is based on reality of the person defaulting or not. Your go positions are based on reality of whether you won or not. Your stock positions are based on the reality of whether the stock went up or not. And it will crunch through billions of data and determine over all the decisions you can make how to maximize your return. So that is the magic behind deep learning. The Excel part is simple. The computation is simple. Coming, learning the formulas by itself is magical. So that is the uh, short tutorial on deep learning. And a lot of people think you know, deep learning, that's a long ways from us. But actually, it is here today. Uh, we saw just in the last few years, and these are four examples in Go and in Texas Hold'em, where uh, deep learning based algorithms or other AI algorithms have completely be the world champion, be the very, very best of humans based on the algorithms I just described. On the bottom, you see something even tougher. Uh, it's perception. It's about recognizing speech and objects at a level higher than human performance. And you can see deep learning was invented about 10 years ago, but most people didn't understand the paper, too much math. And then it was really about uh, seven, eight years ago, people started applying it. And every year, it got better. It's not, a, it's not as magical as I described. You actually have to go in and tune a lot of things. So people figured out how to tune this 
uh, mathematical theory into real practice. So with the tuning, you saw that the jump in terms of object recognition went from 70s up to over human 94% performance. And then speech recognition uh, also went below uh, human um, um, error rate. So in both cases, uh, they are now at better than average human performance in terms of recognizing the words I speak and recognizing um, about a thousand objects, not anything, but not, not full seeing understanding or speech understanding, but enough, uh, enough so that it's beating human at a very tough recognition tasks. So you might say, well, that's still very far away from us, but actually it really isn't. Because if you open up your phone, uh, you are using AI every day. You just don't know it. At least 20 apps on your phone are using AI. So whether you're using the American Facebook, Google, or the Chinese uh, Tencent and Taobao, it's all AI in the background. Or if you're using Meitu, uh, it's AI in the background. So did you, I'm, I'm sure many of you use Taobao, right? Use Taobao. Uh, how many have you noticed over the, today when Taobao recommends something to you, it's much more, something you're much more inclined to buy than five years ago. If you feel that? When you go to Taobao, the ads were random five years ago. Now you see something, you're tempted to buy it, right? And that, why is that? That's because Taobao gathered all the people's buying pattern, and they're predicting on an individual basis, what might you buy? Similarly, um, you guys use, use Meitu. I won't ask you to raise your hands, because uh, I, I know the men will not raise their hands. <laughs> but you know who you are. But did you know this, Meitu, doing a much better job today than five years ago? Back then, you, know, you probably have to go in and you know, make your eyes just the right size, make the, all the shadows and nose perfect so that it lo it, you look more beautiful, but no one thinks you've messed with it. But today, I would bet, and I, again, I won't ask for a show of hands, I would bet the great majority here use an automatic beautification, right? I know I do. <laughs> my, my wife and kids do. It's one click, and how is that done? It's because May 2 has AI in the background, Every time you save a photo, or if you delete a photo, right? You take a selfie and you save it. It's a signal to me too, I like it. Every time you delete it, it's a signal to me too, I don't like it. So it just has to make a, make a big deep learning network that learns, let's do more of the people, things that people like and do less of what people don't like. So that's how um, me too uses AI. And then all the other examples, you know, DD to find the matches, Total to give you, you know, Total is an example. Most of you probably use Total. Total is an example where the news has, there's no editors. Uh, it's all AI doing the um, uh, editorial. Uh, they have, I think, 50 or 50 AI scientists. They're hiring 200 this year, right? So, so pretty much all these companies, they just have AI in the background running on the data. You just don't know. You're the user who thinks the service has improved. But it improved not because some programmer came up with the algorithm, but because it's learning on its own with the data that we contribute. Every day we are guinea pigs to the BAT and Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft. And our data is being used to refine their AI learning results. So AI will be used in a lot of places. Um, I'll go into this more later, but I think fundamentally the first place in which AI will get used is whoever has lots of data, because it requires lots of data to work. And that's going to be in you know, internet, uh, trading, finance, banking, applications, uh, 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 and also um, supply chain, ERP, CRM. Whoever's got all this data, you can use it today. Immediately extract economic value. And that's why AI is going to make lots of money for lots of people very quickly. The next level will be when AI, um, new uses of AI generates data that was never there before. Uh, for example, Amazon Echo. Right. Before, there was never anything that could collect all the noises from our living room and make use out of it. It's quite scary, actually, but, uh, but it's there today, at least in American families. Um, and who knows what Amazon will do with that. So new data, new applications. And then the third level of AI is when AI starts moving all over the place. And this is actually tougher because then you're not dealing with spreadsheets. You've got to deal with the mechanical engineering, industrial engineering, uh, all the difficult issues with control. That's actually tougher to do. But when that happens, that will go in and change our, um, our factory, our, um, our factories, our robots, our security, uh, and, and, and we'll have robots that uh, you know, walk around and do our uh, dishes and cook our uh, food for us, and then we'll have autonomous vehicles everywhere. That's far. That's probably 10 years from now. But these three phases will, will happen, and they will uh, create huge changes in our society. So make it more concrete, I'll give you two examples um, of the actual companies we invested in 
that are uh, doing AI today and making a huge difference. The first one is called MegaV or Face++. Plus Plus. When you're walking through a lot of the airports in China, this technology is installed. And it has the ability to recognize any face from a database of 3 million faces. So think about human capability. We talked about human speech and object recognition. Anyone here can recognize 3 million faces? <sighs> Maybe 3,000, right? So here we have a, a computer algorithm that's uh, three orders of magnitude better than us. And imagine all the world's criminals, most wanted criminals and terrorists, that's, there's hardly 3 million of them. So with this installed in every airport, this could prevent the next 911 uh, from happening because uh, those terrorists will not be allowed to enter the airports. The detection rate is incredibly high, and there's no human uh, police who can uh, know all the names. So that's one application. Another application, you probably saw Jack Ma at, uh, in Germany like four years, three years ago, demonstrating to um, um, Premier um, Merkel uh, with the face recognition technology. Like if you used uh, Alipay, Zhifubao, sometimes uh, it would Mm, not trust you, think, hmm, this is a new phone. Are you sure you are who, say, who you say you are? And it will ask you, well, show me your face, front, side, open your mouth. Uh, <laughs> just to prevent you printing a large photo of someone else and holding it up like that, right? So it will make a dynamic uh, capture of your face and determine if you are, in fact, who you say you are. And if you are, it will let your banking transaction go through. If not, then no. This is much more advanced than credit cards. You know, my American credit cards are terrible because uh, somebody's always in Minneapolis using $30 this day or next day. And every time I call in, they send me a new card and I have no card for a month. It's horrible. Uh, this technology is much better. And also, in fact, AI can make much stronger predictions about fraudulent use as well. But this face recognition can be used. Um, this technology is used by 90% of uh, fintech companies for similar transactions like that. It's used in security applications, and this is a very uh, fast-growing company that's well beyond the uh, uh, people's capability in recognizing faces. Uh, its core team is a bunch of gold medalist engineers from uh, Tsinghua University, and then its chief scientist uh, was the one who actually broke through. You remember seeing a few slides ago where the image object recognition broke through the human result. That was uh, Dr. Sun Jian, who actually did the work, and he's their chief scientist. So this is a billion dollar company that we've invested in, and it's uh, uh, creating value, increasing security, and making economic sense in our um, daily lives. Another example is uh, Smart Finance. Um, they built an app called Yongqianbao. And this product is a simple app you can download. You one click and uh, you download it. Another click, you want 1,000 yuan, 1,000 yuan, okay, 1,000 RMB. And within eight seconds, usually a lot faster, it will send the money right to your phone. So that's how easy loan has become. Um, and of course, you have to enter your name, address, and uh, ID number. And it will use that information, plus any other information on your phone that you agree to send it up, like your contacts, your um, apps, list of apps, similar to the way Facebook um, takes up things from your phone. And it uses all that data into a deep learning network and determines, should I lend you the money or not? And it has, an it has a default rate, which I cannot disclose publicly, but it is uh, much lower than people can achieve, even if people spend hours on each case. And it, as you know, it doesn't make economic sense. For a, a thousand yuan um, loan, it doesn't make sense to have any human work on it. If a human spends an hour, you've already lost money because your interest rate is uh, not as much as the labor cost. So the AI does the complete approval process and it replaces the human completely. And this company is um, going to underwrite about 30 million loans this year. So if you think about the 30 million loans, that's probably more than all the Hong Kong banks can do together, probably larger than almost any other bank in the world. And, and when this starts going beyond uh, small loans, payday loans, when it goes into uh, regular personal loans, small business loans, larger loans, industrial loans, this will replace pretty much all the loan officers in, in, the, in the world. We have just invested in another similar company uh, that is doing customer service rep replacement. And if you look at a, I highly recommend, if you, if you guys are interested in my talk, I would highly recommend a study in 2013 by Oxford University that studies the rate in which people jobs will be replaced by AI. And they list uh, telemarketing as the very, very top. Um, and uh, the good news is, and we're all sick and tired of phone calls that bug us to sell stuff. The good news there is 
there will be no more humans calling you. The bad news, <laughs> the bad news is the robots will be calling you <laughs> with much higher accuracy. We have a company uh, replacing the telemarketing and customer service. We have another company uh, doing uh, much improved um, uh, telesales uh, prospecting so that the conversion rate can go up 60, 70 percent. So in all these examples, you can imagine when you replace a thousand customer service reps, how much money are you saving for the company? When you increase the conversion rate by 60% for a bank, how much more revenue you're generating? So all this is right direct to the bottom line. Um, and then there are other applications. Uh, IBM Watson is working on medical applications. They're matching human capabilities in terms of um, uh, cancer detection, certain types of cancer. Uh, there are also new uh, publications in Nature and Science starting to show that for different types of cancer, uh, skin cancer, melanoma, uh, machines are doing better than some of the best of the doctors. This is not a full medical diagnosis, but specific types of um, recognition of patterns that can at least be a strongly assistant to the, uh, to the human doctor. Professor Chen mentioned about uh, Donald Trump's uh, uh, impact to the world, but we might want to trace back and see what got him elected. Um, there are many factors, but one of which is actually an AI program. Uh, there's a company called uh, Cambridge Analytica. And again, you can Google this and find it on the internet. This company does targeted um, uh, political campaigns, uh, very powerful targeted political campaigns. Take an example. If you're a Facebook user and your clicks are recorded by this company, and if, if, if a political campaign wants you to be pro-gun, Okay, uh, this is the Second Amendment rights in the U.S. If you are a <clears throat> paranoid, careful, introverted, uh, uh, let's, say, let's say lady with no intent on you know, sexual discrimination, we just say that's your profile, okay? That profile will cause it to show a instantaneously created YouTube video that shows a masked, uh, terrible person breaking a window and then showing a gun on the uh, bed, uh, next to the bed and up, out comes the words, um, uh, Second Amendment and gun, your last protection. Okay. Uh, vote <laughs> vote a Second Amendment, vote for Trump. And if you were a, let's say, an extroverted, highly confident, outgoing man, let's say, the ad that you will see is uh, uh, the, uh, during the American Revolution, these Americans carrying guns to the, to the, to the battle, the British, and then with all the, uh, you know, um, patriotic uh, music behind it, and out comes the words, the right that your forefathers fought with their lives, do you want to give it up? You know, both Second Amendment, <laughs> both Donald Trump. So that is the targeted advertising that's using AI uh, to deliver this capability. Uh, much more on Cambridge Analytica on, online. Obviously, AI is a weapon that can be used for different political campaigns and different uh, banks and so on. But in this particular case, one could argue um, many people might not like the way in which it's used. But this is going to be the political campaign of the future. It's going to be fought on the internet using targeted campaigns. So it's really impacting all parts of our lives. So is AI all capable? Let me be very clear that AI is very, very, very narrow. Okay, despite all the great examples I gave you, uh, AI works under five conditions only today. Uh, you have to have a huge amount of data. In, you have to pick a singular domain. It cannot work cross domain. It's one domain, lots of data, lots of data objectively tagged, and then huge amount of supercomputing power and with top scientists who can tweak the algorithms. It, then and only then will you get any of the application I mentioned above from Cambridge Analytica to IBM Watson to um, uh, uh, Meitu to Taobao to Jinri Toutiao, all of them satisfy these five conditions. When you go beyond that, AI just doesn't work. And over time, each of these constraints might be loosened, but uh, today they are all required. Otherwise, AI doesn't work. And then the biggest uh, confusion on the right side is, um, I think today, the two, the two biggest uh, mistakes about AI one is that, oh, it's very far, it's very complex, it doesn't affect us. Hopefully, I've already dispelled that false belief. The second false belief is, oh, AI is science fiction, it's so scary, it's going to come in, my kids are going to fall in love with robots, and uh, you know, robots will be uh, um, malicious and control humans, they have self-awareness, and we're going to become their slaves. Well, that's also completely fallacious. There's no 
uh, no possibility for that to happen in the next 20 years. Uh, can it happen in 1,000 years? Well, who knows? Anything could happen in 1,000 years. But uh, it is not, there's absolutely no sign that any of the achievements uh, under our belts of AI can be extrapolated to such um, outrageous um, capabilities. It's only because we humans uh, exist for our self-awareness and with all our desires that science fiction writers uh, project those desires onto robots and machines. But it is just not true. The computer algorithms, the AIs that we use today has absolutely no uh, desire to uh, preserve their lives. They don't have any self-awareness. There's absolutely no emotion. Uh, when AlphaGo beats a uh, Kejie, it feels no joy. Doesn't want to hug it. <laughs> a Kejie is, you know, crying. We all sympathize with him. But AlphaGo is not gloating or laughing or smiling or happy and doesn't want to hug anybody. And, and then when it's done, Google shut it down, it's gone, right? <laughs> so AI is just a tool for human use. Um, for the foreseeable future. So let's just focus on that and not, not be misled by the many uh, science fiction that's uh, gone crazy. Uh, so can OI, AI get better? Of course, uh, AI will be more diverse. It will be not just deep learning. These are a bunch of tools that will be available to the scientists. AI will start to work on fewer data, and then that's what a lot of these transfer learning types of capabilities are trying to do. AI are going to try to cross domains, maybe one domain at a time. Uh, AI will become more accessible to engineers and not just be required scientists. So all these things I think we'll see. But, but where I stop, and AI will uh, you know, even be able to produce very high quality um, art for amateurs. Uh, you know, we see poetry. Uh, one of our students just wrote some songs with AI. It all sounds pretty good to uh, you know, average person. But, uh, but I think the highest barrier where AI will just not overcome is beyond the tool. In all of these cases, it's just our tool. We control it, we tell it what to optimize, and it has no creativity and no social capability and no self-awareness. So it's important for those of us who are concerned about AI to recognize that there is absolutely no path uh, crossing these three capabilities. Despite what many of the futurists say, uh, they are just wrong. Okay. Uh, and it's not, not just me. If you ask any AI scientists, uh, I was just on a panel with a, a Turing Award recipients. I was talking to some of uh, the top five or six AI scientists. They agree with this point of view. So there's no confusion despite what uh, you know, famous futurists uh, might say about uh, dangers of AIs. That AI can be very dangerous, but only in the hands of the wrong people, uh, just like any technology in the hands of the wrong people, but not by itself. So I mentioned there are three chapters of AI. First, using existing data. Secondly, create more data. And thirdly, AI starts to move around and become robotic. And all three are happening simultaneously. But the first one, obviously, is mature, where we've, we've got so many low-hanging fruits. And in my company, uh, Sinovation Ventures, we're just looking for anyone who's got lots of data. And we're saying, can we help you make more money out of it? And then we'll split the profit with you. Or can we start a company to help someone to do that? And the biggest area with the largest amount of data that's easily accessible is actually financial. So financial data, you can imagine stock market, insurance, banks, they've got lots of data and it's just ready to make money for them immediately. Uh, healthcare is another really good one, but a little tougher because the, the data is in silos, okay? Um, and then uh, um, the second category, you know, I talked about Amazon Echo. What else is possible? Well, new retail, new health, um, supply chain, uh, new ERP, CRM, the, there's a lot of data there that gets co-created and then value is created throughout. Imagine, if, we, if you will, let's say we open you know, 3,000 convenience stores inside China, right? Not only are these convenience stores that um, uh, can sell you things, you know, traditional convenience stores in Hong Kong or US, uh, much more well-developed, or Taiwan or Japan, much more developed than mainland China, um, but you just know what merchandise got moved, and it's all blind other than that. But if we had AI connected to it, you will know who with what profile bought what, almost bought what, and didn't buy what, uh, when. And you've got the customer's profile online, offline, fully integrated. So imagine the magic you can do in the background. Imagine you can, magic you can do in the foreground. 
using face recognition, automatic recognition of objects they took. You can remove the cashiers, you can remove the workers, uh, and gradually move towards an autonomous store. So that kind of capability is somewhere between uh, the fully robotic future and then the merely existing data. You're creating data, combining data, while creating value. That's the second category. And the third category is um, autonomous robots and um, autonomous vehicles. Uh, and, and we have a very specific roadmap on which this will develop. Um, a lot of people believe, you know, um, the SoftBank Pepper will come to our homes. I'm, I'm a strong disbeliever in that. I think humanoid uh, AI is uh, 15, 20 years from now because there's so many more complex issues. You know, deep learning is largely a solved problem. Can be applied. It's just waiting to be applied. Uh, how to move gracefully like a human uh, on various terrain is a completely difficult problem that's going to require uh, multidisciplinary to solve for many, many years to come. So humanoid is going to be very late. And also, as our brains got washed with the science fiction, people have high expectations and compare you with a human when you build a humanoid robot. Plus, in the consumer environments, people don't want to pay for any money, don't want to pay very high prices. And all these devices and sensors are not mature. So I am very, very bearish on the future of humanoid robots at home. If this ever happens, it'll be 15 years, maybe 50 years from now, who knows. But what I'm very quite bullish about <clears throat> are uses that produce immediate economic value. It's, you've got to go back to basics, not from what we see in science fiction, but where can people use this technology and make and save lots of money most quickly? That's what will drive all businesses. So where will autonomous things move first? First in the high-end industrial factories to do replacement for inspection, for high precision, for sensing the screw got put in correctly, for assembling things that humans currently do. For inspecting, you know, for example, take a look at this iPhone. All the, when, it comes, when you get your iPhone, there are no blemishes. But in the manufacturing process, there is a certain percentage of uh, items that got you know, scratched or hurt. Or, 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 um, it's all currently largely uh, visually uh, inspected by humans. That can all be replaced. You know? um, so that's, that's going to be the first fastest to happen. But it's very expensive, so not every manufacturer can do it immediately. It will take time. So that area we're bullish about. Um, commercial robots, maybe, you know, security and things like that. Home robots, no. Uh, maybe some, you know, Amazon Echo, Amazon Echo with a screen, uh, our investment, Xiaoyu Zaijia, those kinds of things that are non-humanoid uh, performing a function, uh, don't require user education, don't look like a human, no eyes, no ears, no hands, no feet, Okay, maybe. Um, and then, but the, these are all small potatoes. The really big one uh, that we all know about is autonomous vehicles. Uh, and autonomous vehicles will completely turn around uh, a lot of things in this society. And to give you an example, uh, you know, we are seeing uh, three big revolutions happening at the same time. First one is the electrification of vehicles. Uh, second is the shared economy, uh, Uber DD. And then the third is autonomous driving, uh, adding value in phases. So when all these things happen, three things happen, and it will be in the 10 to 15 year time horizon, uh, the change to the society is dramatic. It is not at all that you buy your new Tesla, there's a button, when you're tired, you push it, it is, it's like cruise control, this is autonomous control. That's not the benefit of autonomous vehicle. Autonomous vehicle comes in when the entire traffic ecosystem, when the, uh, um, all the transportation becomes humanless, um, when the driving becomes safer than people, there's no, no pollution, uh, there's no traffic jam, your car comes to you just in time when you need it, uh, the car knows your schedule, and uh, the DD Uber is out there waiting for you, the car is built to your size. So when you are traveling on business alone, it, a one person's one-seater will come. The roads will become you know, multi-lanes. Three lanes will become six lanes. So congestion will be gone. They'll all be electrical. And battery power will get better. Even if battery power doesn't get better, it doesn't matter because when the car is nearly out of battery, it will go find a place to uh, charge itself up, right? Um, and the cars will be dramatically safer because cars will talk to each other, right? One car will tell another, I have a flat tire, stay away from me, right? <laughs> Um, and also economics will be injected, right? Professor Chen can you know, say, I'm late to a meeting. Uh, I'm gonna, 
I, why don't you get me to work in five minutes? And then the car will tell all the cars around the car, Professor Chen is in a hurry. I'll give, you, I'll give you three cents for getting out of my way. No? <laughs> Ten cents. Then the cars will negotiate, right? So all this IoT stuff will really, really take off in, 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 this, in this space. And the safety rate will go up dramatically. A lot of people debate the issues like the trolley problem. Some of you may have heard of that. That is the moral issue of an autonomous vehicle facing the choice of killing you know, two adults versus uh, one child, which is worse. Uh, purely academic. I think we don't, I mean, yes, people can debate it, but the important thing is just to move on, get the product launched. We are responsible uh, that the product launched shouldn't be worse than humans in, in the beginning. It should be better than humans. But we're assured that once the product is launched in five years, it, I mean, let's say the safety rate, uh, I think per you know, 100 million miles is uh, fatalities like three for humans. I don't think it's responsible to launch the product uh, with a fatality rate higher than three initially. But I can guarantee you that in five years, three will go down to one. And then one will go down to 0 0.3. And human lives and safety will be dramatically improved because AI learns with data. Not only does AI not get drunk, not get sleepy, not get angry, um, they also uh, learn and get better with time. We, as dri human drivers, our skills plateau after maybe three years of uh, experience. AI keeps getting better. So, so this will dramatically change society and also think about the economic benefits, right? Um, Uber's costs. Three quarters of Uber's costs are with the driver. One third with uh, the, the passenger. So, with, so that's why Uber is losing so much money. And, but imagine when the two-third cost is gone, they will go from wildly uh, at a loss to wildly profitable. So imagine the incentive that's pushing a Uber, a DD, and a Tesla forward. And that will drive progress. And also imagine local governments that will enable this to happen. Uh, one one um, mistaken belief is that uh, the technology will get gradually better. That first, um, the uh, human drives 80%, machine drives 20%. Then the human number goes down, the machine goes up. That's not going to happen. Uh, Google did an experiment of giving a bunch of uh, pretty good L3 level cars to employees and say, take it home for a spin. But this is not autonomous. Keep your hands on the steering wheel all the time. Watch the road. When it makes a mistake, override. And then it keeps cameras in the car. And then uh, when all the uh, Google employees returned the car to Google uh, weeks later, it looked at the video and found that most Google employees climbed in the back seat, had a drink, you know, read newspapers, and uh, made out with their girlfriends. So, <laughs> so this is a simple um, lesson that we learned that uh, we as humans are not to be trusted to be collaboratively driving with the machine. Either the human drives or the machine drives. There's a hard line. So today, you know, they can be assistive, assistive, wake us up when we fall asleep, you know, help us uh, drive on the highway only, parking only, when you have a very clear line. But you cannot have collaborative driving. It's just not a realistic option. So you have to go directly to autonomous. That is our belief. And our investment thesis is based on that. So how can we go autonomous directly? Well, there are lots of ways you can do that. If it's hard with passengers, then do it with trucks. If it's hard in local roads, do it on highways. And if it's hard on public roads, do it in parking lots and uh, private roads and tourist scenes. And that, those are the ways in which uh, cars will get some practice without getting into legal, moral, insurance issues. And then get practice, get data, get better, and eventually hit the road. So we're very optimistic. We also believe that autonomous vehicles will form a huge engine of growth that will make sensors uh, cheaper, more capable, and those will then be taken into our eventual home humanoid robots and the like. Because, you know, robots just like cars have to see, hear, move, and what you learn on the road can be transferred back to the robotic area. So probably the, if you think about the engine or the platform uh, that drove AI, you know, search was a big one, finance will be a big one, but autonomous vehicle will be a really big one, and it will come back to drive robotics. So that's our projection about the future. So this has huge implications to the economy, and maybe we can save some of this for the discussions later. So I will just point out the questions, and then we can answer the ones you're most interested in. Um, I'll bring a couple of issues. One is um, um, many people displaced out of jobs. What hap how, do we, how do we help them find new jobs? Two, what human skills remain useful? Three, how do we change our education system 
so the kids are not immediately displaced when they're out of school. Um, and four, uh, how, how do we socially uh, provide for the people who are displaced? And, and how do we prevent the rich getting richer, poor getting poorer problems in the society? So these are, and, and then, uh, you know, some, there are some ha hand wavy answers. Uh, you know, let's tax, let's tax the rich more. Is that so easy to do? Uh, which government will do that first? Okay. Um, uh, universal basic income. You know, give everybody 1,500 US dollars per month. Well, that's $3 trillion for the US, right? And uh, 15 trillion for China. Can we really afford it? Where does the money come from? And when you give it money to the people, will they really automatically find what they want? And if they don't, what does society do? And if the rich gets richer, poorer gets poorer, and 90% of the people are ultimately out of jobs, how do we prevent a socially uh, uh, unstable situation, right? Why would people not go to the streets? And then what happens about addiction, right? If people are out of jobs, yet they're provided for somehow, why would they not play games all day, right? Wang Zhe Rong Yao, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then VR, you know, they can live in a parallel universe and, uh, and, and, let, and, and have fun. But, but, then, but then will human race perish as a result? So I think the only way human race will perish is either through some human evil using technology or through human um, wide scale giving up, right? We all get addicted to games and then we stop to evolve. So these are the questions we'll uh, save for maybe later discussion. Um, in terms of uh, which jobs get replaced, uh, this is a map that I wrote. It's um, mostly based on the Oxford study uh, I think three to five years repetitive work, five to 10 years standard work, 10 to 15 years um, tougher jobs, not just blue collar, not just drivers, re repairmen, maintenance, but also radiologists. I think radiologists will be out of jobs in, uh, in about 10 to 15 years. And that's a strong signal to those of you who are thinking about medical school and, uh, <laughs> or with children. Uh, I was talking to the Harvard, uh, Dana-Farber, head of Dana-Farber, and we, while we disagree on the uh, how fast AI will take over. We absolutely agree that if you're going entering medical school, please consider doing research because that's something that machine AI cannot do. You know, machines will be able to diagnose and, and of all the diagnoses, reading uh, x-rays and, uh, and the CT and MRI will be relatively easy for computers because imagine if the computer can recognize from three million faces better than humans, why can it not recognize cancer? Uh, better than humans, right? We humans, through our revolution, we're trained to recognize faces. That's how we don't get lost from our parents, right? And we lost that's on that skill. How can we win on recognizing cancer? So radiologists would be one of the uh, categories. I think um, a dermatologist would be another very dangerous category. Psychiatrists, on the other hand, will be a blue booming business <laughs> because many people who are confused and, and, and lost by this AI will be seeking psychiatric help and uh, AI will be no good at that. So anyway, there will be job gains and job losses. And then what jobs are safe? Well, obviously, uh, if AI cannot cross domain, if you're cross domain, you're safe. Uh, AI cannot create, AI just optimizes. So if you're a creator, you're okay. What types of creation? There can be scientific creation, engineering creation, artistic creation. There can be storytelling, right? PR, marketing, novelists, poets, uh, you're all safe. Um, but you have to be really good because uh, AI is starting to write poetry, as you know. So if you're a you know, sophomore level uh, poet, then you know, no, you, the machines will beat you. But if you're a you know, Robert Frost level poet, uh, then, uh, then, you're, then you'll be safe. Okay. Uh, and then some jobs will change. An interesting example I give is uh, doctors, right? Sounds like I'm being quite negative on, on doctors who do diagnosis, but actually I'm not because it will become a great model of human machine collaboration. Uh, machines will get better and better in diagnosis. Initially, the doctor will consult it just in case the machine's right. Later, a doctor will primarily rely on the machine and occasionally override it. And eventually, the doctor will just defer to the machine completely. I don't know if this is over 10, 20, 30, or 40 years, but eventually that will happen. But the human role is very important because the human engagement, empathy, listening to the uh, patient and giving the patient the assurance uh, I think is really, really important. And just listening is important because I mean, times have you been to a doctor when you start saying, okay, I've got the following 10 symptoms. By the time you're done with the second one, doctor says, ah, <laughs> okay, enough. This is your pres pre prescription. Take it, this is enough. This happened to me 
once I got shingles, right, I walked in, and then the doctor says, okay, shingles. I said, wait, let me tell you about my, my headache. She says, I can tell from the way your, uh, you know, scars are forming. I don't need to talk to you anymore. But I didn't feel very good. <laughs> so if the doctor would just, you know, take another 10 minutes and listen to my symptoms, I would feel that that diagnosis is more accurate, even though it's the same, right? And then when I feel better, I cure more, I'm more likely to get cured. Isn't that right? Because of, you know about placebo effect. So, you know, the doctors are just so scarce. They're not spending enough time listening to patients. Imagine if the doctor says, well, Kaifu, I'll visit you at home next week to make sure your scene goes better, right? That's, that's great. And also the doctor can package, can, can be a great storyteller, right? So imagine if I went to my, uh, you all know I, I had cancer a couple of years ago. So imagine if I went to an AI doctor and says, well, Kaifu Li, you have um, um, follicular, fo um, <clears throat> Uh, you have follicular lymphoma stage four, and the uh, likelihood of five-year survival is 26%. Well, I would be devastated if that's the message they gave me, right? But my, you know, imagine the doctor says, well, you know, uh, you got some tough problem, but, uh, you know, Kai Fu Li had the same problem, and five years later, he's healthy again. So if you follow the uh, same, uh, you know, chemotherapy and uh, target therapy, you have a good shot too. Well, now the, now the patient's recovery rate must be higher because of placebo effect. So that's how AI and uh, AI's evolution will create many more doctors than today. Maybe slightly lower paid, uh, but larger in number, able to reach out to poorer provinces in China, able to reach out to Africa. Everyone who wants to consult a doctor, there can be one. Sometimes it's purely AI, sometimes it's AI with a remote medicine. And I think humankind will be better for it and employment will not go down, but go up as a result. And then in terms of education, uh, actually the Fundamental principles have not changed. This is how I raise my kids. This is how I believe education should be. If we believe the world will be, end up with two types of primary jobs with the AI's uh, success, 10% or some, some small number of creative jobs, larger number of socially oriented jobs, well, what should we do? Well, we should provide an education where the kids find an area in which they can be creative, go after their passion, work very hard, and not, they're challenged not just by their competitive um, humans, but also by AI. They have to work really hard. The 10,000 hour rule applies. And, and then at the same time, you gotta be ready in case um, you're in the 90%, which is okay too, but then you have to have balanced social communication skills, empathy, talking to people, uh, caring for people. And, and that's also how we will get a sense of satisfaction. Right. Imagine the 10% of people uh, generating lots of value for society and making lots of money. And then the 90%, uh, the reality is the 90% might have a net aggregate negative contribution to the economics in the world. That's just the reality. It's very different from the rise of China. Right? China rose up, and to some extent India rose up because of the population dividend. There's a lot of people who are paid less, so we manufacture. Each one adds to the, comp uh, the, to the country's uh, gross domestic uh, uh, product. Uh, but so, so you could say the country's value is uh, the population size times the value of each person, roughly speaking. But in the future, we're going to enter an age of 10% creative people who have a huge multiplier and 90% of the people who have a much smaller multiplier. That's possibly a negative multiplier. So the question for our country and education is, how do we get more than 10%? And how do we get the 10% to add the most value? And second is, how do we make sure the 90% uh, are able to look forward to a life of um, self-actualization, contributions to society? And I think the best way is so they can find some profession that appeals to their heart. They feel like they've helped people and their love and emotion and connection and empathy have contributed to the society and makes them feel good at night, even though economically they might not be the best contributors to the economy. So I think that's an important aspect when we think about the future of education. So uh, to conclude, I think when I started out in AI in 30 some years ago, I thought we were gonna figure out how humans think and maybe connect computers to humans. But I realize now is what we've accomplished is actually a bunch of narrow AI algorithms that are optimizers for singular domains. And so it's very limited and not at all touching how we think. Nevertheless, those singular optimizers can be applied to take over a lot of what humans do and really make several huge contributions to society. 
One is it might create so much economic value that we eradicate poverty. Uh, secondly, it will free us from the repetitive work that we currently do and let machines take care of that. Okay? And lastly, it might get us to really think, what, why do we exist on this earth? I think it is to create and to love. And those are the two things for the 10 and the 90%. So that really it's not figuring how our brains work, but how our hearts work. Thank you. Thank you.